Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome to our ILSA webinar. We will get started in just about one minute. So thank you for joining us. While we're waiting, I am showing a little bit of information. If you are interested in learning more about the ILSA Legal Service Provider Network, you can send an email to our ILSA info at icf.com with the subject line, joining the LSP network. So find out more about our ILSA Legal Service Provider Network. We will get started here in just a moment. Again, for those of you still joining, thank you for joining us. This month's webinar, we have two wonderful guest speakers for you and we will get started here in just a moment. All right, well, we are going to get started promptly at one o'clock. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Becky Blenderman. I am from the ILSA team and would like to welcome you to this month's webinar, Managing the Legal and Ethical Implications of Domestic Violence. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and today we have two wonderful guest speakers who are going to spend some time with you this afternoon sharing some information and um, hopefully have time to answer some questions today as well. So let's uh, jump in. A couple of things just to note before we get started, we are recording this session today. After the session, we you will get a copy of the slides from today as well as a copy of this recording. This is an interactive webinar. We have questions and scenarios that we are gonna walk through today. Your participation, participation is encouraged. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. We will try to get the questions answered today. And if we don't get them answered during the session, we will answer them after today's session. Please be mindful of the mute button. Remember to keep yourself muted so we all don't hear you eat, drinking your coffee or anything like that. And if you do have any technical issues during today's webinar, please message Hannah Deek in a private chat and she will do her very best to help you. And as I said, after today's webinar, you will get a copy of the slides. You will get a copy of the recording. And we would love for you to fill out a quick five question evaluation that will be sent out right after today's webinar. So this is wonderful. It looks like we have participation from a lot of different locations. We would love it if you would put your name and your location in the chat, particularly if this is your first webinar. Please go ahead and put your name, or well, if we see your name, Put in your location of where you're from if this is your first webinar. And today's agenda, we are going to talk a little bit about identifying domestic violence situations, responding to a disclosure of violence. Then we will dig into forms of legal relief, some common scenarios, resources and safety me measures, and then ethical implications in immigration cases. Our speakers for today, our first speaker is Grace Hong. Grace is the Director of Policy, Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. Our second speaker is Dina Sharuk, Senior Legal Advisor to the ABA Commission on Integration. And Grace and Dina both have uh, will have the opportunity to introduce themselves for a moment, and we will go ahead and get started. So Grace, I will turn it over to you first. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me and welcome everybody. As uh, Rebecca mentioned, I'm Grace Wong. I'm the Director of Policy at the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. And I've been here about seven years. We are a national resource center funded by HHS and the Department of Justice, as well as other funding sources that work on technical assistance, training, research, policy advocacy, which is what I do, and uh, community building around issues facing domestic violence and sexual assault and human trafficking survivors from Asian, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. And I am a, a former practicing immigration attorney, and I've been working in, to support immigrant survivors of domestic and sexual violence for almost 30 years now. And one of our favorite projects here at APIGBV is supporting the Alliance for Immigrant Survivors which is focused on 
improving policies to support um, immigrant survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And so um, look that up, immigrantsurvivors.org, if you have an interest in trying to improve systems for immigrant survivors. And um, I'm going to move on on to my presentation, or I guess Dina's going next, and, and then I'll move on to my presentation. Thanks. Well, I won't, I won't take too much of your time. <laughs> I'm crazy. I'm, I'm Dina Shrug. I'm a senior legal advisor to the commission, ABA Commission on Immigration. I've had my researches largely in, in immigration and ethics, and I have taught immigration law, refugee and asylum law at the University of Virginia School of Law and Georgetown University Law Center. And uh, I'm pleased to be here today, and I'll turn it back over to you, Grace. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and get started. It is what I call Domestic Violence Action Month, as opposed to just awareness. I hope that there's awareness going on every every month of the year. And uh, there are a lot of activities that we're all working on to try to uh, improve the situation for survivors right now. So I hope you're participating in your local communities. To get us started, so in terms of the work that you are all doing with Afghan individuals, you know, you may identify domestic violence or have some suspicion that it's coming up in your cases. And so what we're going to cover just a little bit is just how you, when you see certain behaviors or you get a disclosure, what you might do with that. So up on the screen is the power and control uh, wheel that was developed by the uh, Duluth Domestic Violence Community Project that many of you may have seen in various iterations. There are, we've also developed an immigration specific power and control wheel, and it recognizes that immigration status is often leveraged as a tool of power and control. And so when we talk about domestic violence, especially in the context of uh, doing legal work with community members, we want to make sure that we recognize that it's a pattern of abusive behavior in a, a relationship that's used by one partner to, to gain or maintain power and control over the other intimate partner. And it's important to recognize that it's not just physical act. It can be sexual violence. It can include economic abuse. It can include technological abuse that we're seeing much more of these days, including harassment and doxing, those kinds of things. And it can be threats, which may or may not have any physical component. It can be in the context of working with immigrant survivors. It can be threats to have somebody deported. It could be threats to not continue with immigration paperwork. It can be threats to have children taken away or threats that somebody would be sent out of the country without their children. It can be a whole range of different things. But uh, this is a, a common graph that victim advocates often use with survivors as they're talking through, you know, what might constitute or, you know, what might be going on in situations uh, with your partner? Are these some of the things that are happening? And I just want to make sure that people are clear that our immigration law does recognize that, you know, extreme cruelty or emotional abuse as part of that pattern of domestic violence. And it's important to know that that's often different from our state legal codes that might specify only, you know, physical acts or threats of physical acts or, you know, pushing, hitting, those kinds of things. And so I want to make sure that everybody understands that it's much broader than that. And what you want to look at is this, whether there's a pattern of ongoing behavior that's intended to maintain power and control. We move on to the next slide, please. Okay. And so the other thing I want you to recognize too, in the context of the emotional abuse or cruelty is that these are the some of the impacts that can affect survivors of domestic violence. And they're important to know um, pr primarily because we want to think about how people are experience the violence because in some of the cases from the legal perspective, you may want have to prove that, you know, the concept of extreme cruelty or mental injury as an element in a Violence Against Women Act or a visa case. And so um, in terms of being able to get the information from a survivor, you know, some of the things you're going to want to talk about are how they were impacted by things that their partner did. And so it is subjective. And so some pe people may not experience, you know, some of the physical violence or acts 
that their partner committed against them or uh, engaged in against them and so may not consider it abuse, which is, you know, subjective on their part. So I'm going to move us on to the next slide, please. So some of the things you may identify in, in working with clients, you know, I want to share this from my experience, has been that they may not necessarily recognize the behavior that they've experienced as abuse, or they may have a hard time talking about it to the extent that they may have been traumatized or, or hurt. And so just in terms of developing a relationship with your client and getting them to, if you're exploring, you know, getting them resources or exploring possible legal relief they may have, it's really important to explain to them why you're doing that. And in, uh, a trauma-informed response um, helps develop trust, rapport, and, and in your work, you would be explaining, hopefully, why it is you're asking that you're looking to see if they might be eligible for some kind of other legal relief that you're concerned about how they're doing and maybe want to refer them to other resources in your community that may be supportive to help them process what's going on, to help them develop relationships with others in the community. Um, and so these are some ideas on how you might want to explore talking with your client about whether they've experienced domestic violence or abuse or other kinds of harm and how to pull out some of that information without, you know, trying to appear as if you're cross-examining them. And that is something that often I've heard from many attorneys over the years and uh, seen happen is that, you know, folks who have been traumatized may experience even deeper trauma. And sometimes, you know, extreme cases reach a state where, you know, they're not able to talk to you at all or, you know, they've lost trust, et cetera. And so thinking about how how to approach somebody, you know, explaining why you're asking and remembering that they may not code or re recall everything in a sequential way in the way that you want to be able to put together a statement. And so these are some ideas in terms of being able to ask some of those questions. So let's move on to some examples of particular scenarios where folks may, oh, excuse me, let me talk about forms of different forms of legal relief that may be available for survivors of domestic violence. And first and foremost, the most common, well, one of the first forms of relief that has developed in our law is the Violence Against Women Act provisions, including the self-petition, in which you know, somebody who would otherwise be eligible to petition based on a family relationship is able to uh, apply on their own if they can establish that they've been subjected to battery or extreme cruelty. They have to show that they are either a child or a parent or the spouse of a lawful permanent resident or U.S. citizen. In the context of intimate partner violence, it's the spouse of an LPR or a spouse of U.S. A citizen, and they have to show that they suffered battery or extreme cruelty. And they, you know, the benefits of getting a self petition include being eligible for a broader range of public benefit after five years of a presence in the United States. They are, you know, they, they fit into that family visa preference system. And so the wait times are going to be the same as those as if their spouse was petitioning for them. And and VAWA really recognize how immigration status is used as a tool of power and control and intended to take the immigration process away as, as that tool of manipulation and, and coercion. There's also the U visa, which is a very commonly known remedy for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and other qualifying crimes. Right now, if somebody were, the important thing about the U visa is somebody has to get a law enforcement certification that specifies that that individual has been helpful in the investigation or prosecution of criminal activity. And so one of the challenges for many immigrant survivors who are afraid to call law enforcement or access, you know, legal, the legal system is that without that certification, they won't be able to apply for a U visa. And so... Uh, we, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Other forms of relief for 
survivors of domestic violence may include trafficking visas if somebody has been subjected to forced labor or slavery or yeah, forced to work in the sex industry for or in engage in in uh, labor or other uh, forced activity based by their partner. And so we've seen in many cases, for example, people who sponsor a spouse and then uh, have them basically work as a servant in, in their home or as a sexual slave. And so um, those are the examples of where somebody would be eligible for trafficking these. Um, and the reality of the trafficking visa process is it's a shorter wait than the U visa process. And, you know, that these individuals are eligible for the same range of, of public benefits as refugees and asylees, and so maybe have access to a broader range of benefits. There are also other legal remedies for victims, including if somebody is a victim of domestic violence and they have a well-founded fear of you know, persecution, harm, if they are removed to their home country. You know, this is a uh, rap, you know, area of law where we are doing a lot of advocacy to make sure that private harms in another country would be recognized for protection in terms of making sure that our domestic law recognizes that people may fear what constitutes persecution in their home country in the form of domestic or sexual violence or human trafficking or other kinds of gendered harm and their law enforcement or the government will not protect them or will, you know, won't extend protections in that home country. And then there's special immigrant juveniles for, you know, abused and neglected kids. And so I'm going to move us on to a couple of scenarios because we're uh, running a little bit behind. So... Here's a common scenario that you may come across where you have a client and their husband is a permanent resident and he's using the petition process to threatening her uh, that if she goes to let the police know about the domestic violence, that she won't be able to get status and, you know, or may be concerned that he's, uh, you know, might have concerns about losing his status and that she will be ineligible for status. And so when you come across this situation, what do you need to know? What more do you need to know about the situation uh, in order to identify whether she's eligible for some kind of status? And so you'll want to know, learn whether or not, you know, they can show that they the abuser has that status, that they're a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. This individual needs to show that they are a victim of battery or extreme cruelty and that they resided together in the United States at some point, that they can demonstrate good moral character for your client, and they, they can show that they entered the marriage in good faith. And they may be able to include their children as uh, derivatives in their petition if they aren't married um, and under the age of 21. I also, next slide. So what evidence needs to be provided? Um, what kind of proof that would you need to show in order for her to apply for a self-petition? And so is this, if you can have, do you want people to put, you can just put right in the chat your answer. Go ahead and put in the chat, folks, if you can, if you have an answer for that question, or you can raise your hand. Yes, I'm seeing marriage certificate, police report, evidence of a good faith marriage, which might be, yes, proof of living together, photos from a marriage, letters to the couple. Yeah, evidence they've lived together. Yes, definitely statements for witnesses. Possibly a psych eval that may not be necessary, you know, if somebody's already accessing that. One of the important things to know about VAWA cases and U visa cases is the agencies are required to take any credible evidence of any of the elements and want to flag that in terms of working with survivors to think about, you know, what's going to be a trauma informed response in terms of gathering evidence working with them, making sure you're explaining why you need certain 
pieces of information, what you're trying to prove is important to talk with them about. And so one of the things I just want to flag is the, I did note in terms of psychological evaluations can help, but they're not absolutely required. Next slide, please. So what happens if she's no longer living in the home or if she's divorced from him or, you know, if, you know, she calls, does call the police and he ends up in removal proceedings and loses his status? You know, what, what happens in that context? And one of the important things to know about VAWA self-petitioning is that uh, if she's divorced, she doesn't have to be living in the home in order to apply to do a VAWA self-petition but she will have to show that the marriage was entered into in good faith. And if she's divorced, she has up to two years after the divorce to be able to self-petition. And so one of the things I know that many people do is try to extend the length of the divorce proceeding so that somebody can get applications in. And then does she qualify for benefits and will they impact her application? So VAWA self-petitioners do qualify for Federal public benefits, though, there is a five-year federal bar to, you know, after entry for individuals to be able to seek federal benefits. But many states, including California, Illinois, Washington, and others, do often provide state-funded benefits during that five-year window. And uh, after the five years after entry, somebody would be eligible for federal public benefits. They also, um, in terms of VAWA self-petitioners and the concern that if they seek benefits, whether they be state-funded or federal-funded, um, whether they impact her application, um, the public charge in admissibility ground does not apply to VAWA self-petitioners, and so that should not be in concern, and you, you should be letting folks know that you know those benefits are there, be able to support survivors, and that they should access them and so that is one of the big areas of concern that people have. And we continue to hear all over the country that victims are afraid to access public benefits. And, you know, I'm not going to go into a deep dive on the public charge rule, but certainly housing, food and medical under the current rules do not impact the public charge um, determination. And so folks should be accessing those. It's only cash for income uh, maintenance or long-term institutionalization that would possibly impact somebody, but they don't apply to self-petitioners anyway. So let's move on to the next scenario. Okay, client B has photos from the emergency room showing a broken arm and nose. What other information do you need from client B to ascertain uh, possible legal relief? Okay, any thoughts on this? What do you need to ask to find out whether they have other legal relief? Awesome. Doctors know who broke their arm. I don't even need to know that. <laughs> yeah, who hurt them? Possibly police report. Okay. ER, I don't know. Oh, police report. Okay. So some thoughts on what you might want to know. Um, yes, who hurt them? Information about who hurt them. Possibly the medical records. Yes, what the status of the abuser might be. You don't even know if that you want to know if they're married. Is this person married to this other individual? And whether or not they have immigration status, because you want to know whether this you know person might qualify for VAWA self petition. And it, you know, you want to know whether the client even knows who the person is that broke their arm in the nose. It's uh, possibly you know, involves, it could be a potential U visa case, though, you know, it could have been a stranger that hurt them, could have been um, their partner, we don't know. And you want to know whether they actually contacted law enforcement. It's possible they didn't contact law enforcement at all. You know, uh, as folks have noted, a police report would be good to know if they've got one, but they may not have actually access to law enforcement. And so in that context, in order to be able to apply for legal relief, whether it be a VAWA, self-petition, or possibly a visa, you're going to need to know some of that other information. Correct. Person, whether the person has legal status in the state, you may or may not know. It might have been a stranger. 
If there's no police report, is VAWA off the table? No, it's not off the table. If they happen to be, they're married to this person, and that person has legal status, whether it be a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, the person can still VAWA self-petition. And photos from the emergency room could be provided as evidence of physical battering or of extreme cruelty. They don't need to have a police report. Medical records are sufficient. Other, you know, a declaration is sufficient for a VAWA self petition. Also, um, I didn't mention it before, but VAWA also has a remedy in deportation proceedings if the individual, you know, ends up in removal proceedings and they can apply for VAWA cancellation. What if they're on a fiance visa to the extent that, you know, they, if they haven't married the individual, they're not going to be able to apply under VAWA, but they may have a possible remedy under U visa if they uh, are able to get law enforcement certification uh, that they've been uh, a victim of domestic violence or possibly a felonious assault. So, okay, next, uh, we're going to actually move on from this scenario because we're running uh, a little short on time. So why don't we go on to finding resources? So I just want to share some resources for all of you in terms of being able to provide these to your clients. You know, the first one is National Domestic Violence Hotline 1-800-799-SAFE. It's a national phone line, or there's also a text function to the hotline or there are ways to interact with the hotline on over the internet at hotline.org. They have a, a huge database, and many of you may be resources in their databases that can link folks to individuals. And they do do safety planning with individuals. They also are able to get language interpreters on phone with them to be able to talk with clients. I also want to share this resource about statewide and territorial domestic violence coalitions um, because I couldn't go through and list every DV domestic violence program in the country. One place to start to find out what's in your state or territory is, you know, your state hotline because, or excuse me, your state domestic violence coalition because they are membership organizations of all the domestic violence programs in your state to be able to find out what's in your local community. For those of you working with Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Middle Eastern, mostly Middle Eastern and North African victims, we have a directory of services at my organization of victim service providers. And you want to learn, too, if your community has like a, a county level or state level coalition of victim services programs to be able to do safety planning and provide resources for victims. Next slide. Please. We just add, here are a couple resources in the slides for you. We do have that power and control wheel available in Dari and Pashto. If uh, that would be helpful to work with your clients in, in Dari or Pashto. For those of you who want to learn more about doing trauma informed legal practice, the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health has a great legal resource. And we have other, we have other um, background resources in working with survivors, both at bonnet.org and at my organization at apigbv.org. Some specific legal resources as they relate to VAWA, U visas, T visas, SIJ, et cetera. ASISTA Immigration Assistance has some great legal resources as well as the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Program online. And then the ABA Commission on, on Domestic and Sexual Violence, we've got some resources there that we also do regular training for attorneys on how to represent uh, survivors of domestic and sexual violence. So I'm going to uh, leave off from there and pass it to Hannah so that, or excuse me, to Dina so that she's got time to talk with you about ethics. Thank you so much, Grace. That was super helpful. Thank you. So let's turn attention now to those ethical considerations. And here's a little bit of what we're going to be covering in the next section. As a note, the majority of Afghan cases that we're seeing these days are humanitarian claims by family groups. And in those cases, immigration attorneys are usually representing the entire family unit. And our responsibilities as attorneys can become particularly cumbersome when we're dealing with domestic violence amongst family unit clients. So I'll largely be focusing on that here today. Let's hop on to the next slide. 
Okay, so what guides our ethics as practitioners in immigration? Well, we have the rules of professional conduct in all jurisdictions in the United States, and most jurisdictions model their rules after the ABA's model rules of professional conduct. So I'm going to be relying on those model rules here. It's important to note that attorneys are beholden to the ethics rules of all jurisdictions in which they're barred and where they're practicing. And I bring that up because immigration attorneys can appear before immigration courts and USCIS in any state, regardless of where they're barred. So each jurisdiction has a body that's worth notice, noting that each jurisdiction also has a body that adjudicates ethics claims and many produce uh, legal opinions, and those legal opinions can clarify the rules. Was the one in doubt about your ethical responsibilities in your jurisdiction? All jurisdictions have hotlines where their attorneys can call in to seek guidance on their professional responsibilities, and I recommend checking in any time you have a query so that you can be assured in your course of action. And the Immigration Court, or EOIR, has professional conduct rules for folks that appear before them. And you can find those rules at 8 CFR 1003 subpart G. Um, uh, so finally, there are our personal ethical standards. And it's critical that we confront those standards, not just because we're a touchy-feely bunch, but because they relate to those professional rules of responsibility. When we're required by law to take action, or if the rules say that we shall do something, then we don't have too much wiggle room. But where the rules indicate that we may act, that's where our personal ethical standards have space to play a role. So let's hop on to the next slide. And let's talk about some of those big ticket rules, and I'm not gonna read them all out. Um, I'm just gonna give you the cliff notes. And here we're talking about conflict of interest. So as attorneys, we have a duty of loyalty to our clients, and we should not be representing clients whose interests we know, in the case, are at odds with one another. And that's what conflict is. Conflict just means that you're that pursuing one client's interest comes at a material cost to the other client, or there's a risk that you as the attorney will be limited in your representation of one client because of your relationship to the other. There are ways to limit one's representation of one's clients by making it clear in your engagement with that client. But in the domestic violence context, it's really not realistic to serve both an abuser and a person who's being abused. Let's hop on to the next slide. So comment two, I love the comments section. The comments, comment two of the conflict of interest rule has guidance on how to go about assessing whether at the intake stage you should be taking on the representation of clients who could potentially be in conflict. I wanted to highlight this too because we're going to talk later uh, about being sure to identify who your clients are in a case and making that clear in any engagement paperwork and that we'll want to keep an eye out for potential conflict at the intake stage. Informed consent, which is brought up throughout, involves disclosing a conflict and allowing one party to waive their rights to the attorney's protection when in conflict but it's really, again, not very practical or feasible in a case of domestic violence. Hop on to the next slide. Comment four highlights that in cases of conflict, after you've begun representation of both clients and that conflict can't be cured, an attorney will ordinarily have to withdraw. So let's go on to the next slide. And here we have our duty of confidentiality to our clients. As a general rule, we cannot reveal information relating to the representation of our clients unless our client knows their rights with respect to confidentiality and waives them. But there's also an important exception here. We may, so again, here we have that may language, reveal information relating to the client's representation to the extent that we reasonably believe it's necessary to prevent certain death or substantial bodily harm. And that's an important exception here, but we should also note it's it's really qualified. The bar is super high. We need to be reasonable in our assessment that it is necessary to reveal the information to prevent certain death or substantial bodily harm. So there's a lot of qualifiers there. Some scenarios are going to be really clear, like if your client adamantly tells you with a genuine intent that they're going to kill someone uh, and you're not able to dissuade them, that seems a bit more clear. 
But strong scenarios, and, and I'll, I'll probably posit that most scenarios are a little less clear, like if your client tells you they're going to punch someone in the face. Let's go on to the next slide. Here, comment six sheds a little bit more light on what reasonably necessary to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm means. And it here they clarify that it's reasonably certain to occur if it will be suffered imminently or if there's a present and substantial threat that substantial harm will happen at a later date if the lawyer doesn't intervene. And if you encounter such a scenario, it's going to be understandably stressful and anxiety inducing. I cannot encourage reaching out to those state hotlines enough in times that I've encountered ethical quagmires, and there have been those instances involving DV. Seeking that advice has elucidated the course, but also mitigated the, the weight of the ethical decision. So it's, it's good to know what the guidance is there. Let's hop on to the next slide. I've included comment 12 here uh, because it highlights the possibility of being compelled to report by law, and that exists in jurisdiction where lawyers are mandatory reporters in cases of abuse of children. And we'll discuss that a bit more shortly. Let's hop on to the next one. Thank you. I have included comment 31 because it highlights issues where clients ask you to keep secrets from one another. And if the secret affects the client's interest, then you can't keep the secret. You know, if, if one secret of one client affects the other client's interest, then you can't keep the secret without compromising one of the client's rights. And there's an important note towards the end of this rule here that highlights managing your client's expectations and intake. You should, at the outset, advise them of your role, that as their attorney, you owe a duty to each of them, and that the concept, uh, consequences of, of conflict um, could be withdrawal. Let's hop on to the next slide. And here we have rules about diminished capacity, and this applies to folks who could be developmentally delayed or psychologically incapacitated, but it also really applies to children. When an attorney reasonably believes a client has diminished capacity and is at risk of physical harm and cannot act on their own behalf, the attorney should take protective action, such as seeking out a guardian ad litem, a conservator, or a guardian. So it's really important to note that a lot of those mechanisms, a guardian ad litem, conservator, guardian, they're not really available in the immigration space. And where this rule is particularly important is in the case of withdrawals and making sure a child client doesn't flip through the cracks just because you've withdrawn from your representation. It's important to note that if you are concerned about the well-being of a child client, that your state is going to have those resources. So your state bar, you should reach out to them in, in those instances. And those resources that are available to you as the attorney to point for those protective actions for your client are going to vary by jurisdiction. Let's hop on to the next slide. Here we have the rules about withdrawal and declining representation. You have to withdraw if representation will violate the rules of professional conduct or law. So, um, spoiler alert, there's going to be a lot of withdrawal involved when there's domestic violence between two clients. Let's hop on to the next slide. And here are instances listed in which you may withdraw. And I want to particularly highlight number four here. In cases where the client insists from a lawyer taking action that the lawyer finds to be repugnant and to which you fundamentally disagree, that's, that's a place where you may withdraw. Using, again, that may language here taps into our own personal ethics as attorneys. Let's hop on to the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what these rules look like in practice. I hope you memorized everything I've set up and so now. So at the, at the intake, it's important to explain our roles as attorneys to manage our clients' expectations and, in fact, give them some agency in their own case. If they know what your role is, they know what your responsibilities and duties are and understand what their responsibilities and duties are in their own representation, that gives them a little bit of control. It's also important to explain that you're bound by ethics rules and that you owe loyalty and other duties to each individual client. So in that same vein, my general guidance for uh, representing families is this. Interview your potential clients when they're together and when they're, and you want to interview them individually. 
So you should be taking this opportunity to observe the dynamics between the clients. And if you meet resistance from a client who doesn't want to be split up and met with individually, you can frame your role as an attorney and your duties as a representative for each family member as the reason for such a request. There are also ethical inter uh, implications when using interpreters. I give a whole talk on that subject alone, but I won't. For the big headline, try to avoid using folks as interpreters who are personally connected to either the clients, because that could impact the content of your interviews and the freedom with which your client can speak. If at the intake stage, a potential client reveals a material conflict, one that impacts one client's right adversely from the other, then you can't take on the case. And that includes where one reveals that there's domestic violence. And that can be really emotionally difficult for us as attorneys, especially Im immigration attorneys serving vulnerable populations. Our instinct might be to want to advise a vulnerable potential client as to their right. But if we do that, in the case of abuse, we're compromising the other potential client who's come to us seeking our representation. So in that case, you would not want to take on the case and suggest to the parties that they seek independent representation without breaking the confidences of either party. Let's move on to the next slide. And it seems like we're running low on time. So we're probably gonna, and we should probably end up talking faster, but I will try to get through this clearly. As just kind of a brief note on legal service agreements, I've, I've included a link here to another resource at the ABA on ethics for family groups. And so I suggest you uh, go there if you want to include any of these clauses in an engagement agreement. Let's move on to the next slide. So let's talk about spouses. When we're representing spouses, you want to remember that you have a duty of loyalty to both of those clients, and it's natural to want to side with a client, like we said, but we can't do that without compromising. We can't do that without compromising one client for the other. So even telling a client who's reporting domestic violence that they should or shouldn't contact the police Again, something that a lot of us would want to do, you're really going to be harming that spouse who's accused of the abuse. So there's no choice here but to withdraw. And your services as an attorney would be materially limited by the disclosure. So not all conflicts across the board are going to require withdrawal, but domestic violence is one that you really can't get around. So, so it's really not a conflict that can be cured with disclosure to all clients. Additionally, it's important to note that confidentiality rules extend beyond the representation. So even after uh, the case uh, where you've withdrawn from the case, you can't reveal the content of the representation. But remember the exception, remember that risk exception we had to the duty of confidentiality. Before you let that client reporting the abuse walk out of your office, you'll want to probe further to understand if they're in danger of serious imminent harm of, of death or serious physical harm and the likelihood of that going forward, especially if you don't intervene. So. A lot of cases will fall short of that imminent danger. And in that case, where it falls short, you will still owe that duty of confidentiality. How do you break the news to that client, those clients? The point is that the way that you do it when you're breaking the news to the clients that you can't represent them is that you do it in a way that doesn't compromise or put the client who suggests that they're said that they're being abused. You don't want to put them at risk. So you'll want to be a bit vague. I can no longer represent you because I know that you, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to tell them straight out what's the reason for your withdrawal, but you would say that you're bound uh, by your your responsibilities as an attorney and that you understand as you've collected the facts in the case, you understand that you can no longer represent your clients. And you may want to offer those clients a list of potential attorneys. You want to test the water here and see, you know, whether or not, you know, you want to tread softly here, but if you feel confident uh, confident enough to do so, you may want to advise the clients to get separate attorneys, that their cases might be furthered by having separate attorneys. But again, tread softly and, and read the room. If, if you think that you're walking on thin ice in terms of, of revealing something that could harm one of your clients, you, you'll want to do so carefully and less might be more. Uh, let's move on to the, the slide about children. Quite, We just have about about a minute left to go. As we mentioned earlier, children are understood to have that kind of diminished capacity. Similar to spouses, you can't represent one client at the harm, at the detriment of the other. 
So they have, there would be cases uh, in cases of domestic violence, they may require, they will require withdrawal. And there's still that serious harm exception to confidentiality. If you determine that the threat of harm is not in, imminent and that you're not ethically required to report the abuse, you should still review your state log to determine whether or not you're a mandated reporter of abuse or neglect when it comes to children. Some states that historically made attorneys mandatory reporters include Mississippi, Nevada, Ohio, and Oregon. And those rules can change, so you should always check in about with your state laws. And let's hop on to that last slide about withdrawals. Just really quickly, withdrawal of representation before the immigration court has to be approved by the judge, and they can be requested either orally or in written in a written motion, and you'll want to make that motion as early as possible to give the clients the opportunity to find new representation. Some courts might be reluctant to grant a withdrawal in the absence of substitution of counsel. And similarly, when withdrawing from representing the client, you're not going to want to betray that confidentiality before the judge and that in a way that could certainly prejudice the client. So where conflict, for example, arises between two spouses, you shouldn't divulge the details of the conflict in the motion to withdraw representation, but you should indicate that you cannot, that you have a professional responsibility, a professional duty to withdraw from the case at hand and provide limited and additional information only insofar as it will serve the argument for withdrawal and not prejudice any of the clients. Okay, I'm going to save some time for Q&A. I hope I didn't speak a million miles a minute. <laughs> so back to you. All right, great. Thank you both, Dina and Grace. Very informative. I am going to, let's see, we have, we have about five minutes left for questions. So I am going to give folks the opportunity, if you have a question you would like to ask of Grace or Dina, please feel free to go ahead and put that question in the chat, or you can come off mute, please raise your hand, and uh, we will call on you, and you are welcome to come off mute and ask your question. So please go ahead and type something in the chat if you have a question, or go ahead and raise your hand. Give folks just a moment. I think we have a, co a question about how you recommend withdrawing after a conflict has arisen due to domestic violence. And, you know, here where, where a client, where you're alone with one client who's telling you that you have, that they're um, suffering from domestic violence, you may want to explain to them exactly why you can't continue with the representation that this has created a conflict in the representation because you owe a duty of loyalty to each client and that as a result, you're going to have to withdraw and, and suggest that they get another attorney and you can assure them that you're not going to reveal the confidence, but that you are going to have to say that you're going to have to withdraw. And it's a kind of a grayer area, but I know that in my case, in my case, I, I had suggested to, to a client who's really fearful, you know, after finding out whether or not there's substantial imminent harm. If, if that's not the case, there isn't imminent harm that's going to be quite substantial with any kind that we can't say with any kind of certainty. I've kind of mentioned that all folks in the United States have access to 911 in an emergency, and that is a way to contact the police. But see, that's also a very gray area because I'm not straight out saying to them, call the police if you're in danger or or find this resource. I'm talking quite broadly there, and I think it's it is a bit of a gray area. And then when in terms of bringing everyone together, I might raise it in a, in a really broad way to say, you know, while preparing this case, it's become clear to me that I, I won't be able to continue with this representation. I'm sure I'm sorry for the inconvenience that it, it, it creates. I might put something in writing that again is quite general and broad and suggest to the client that they find, give them a referral list with other attorneys. I might also suggest again, gauging those clients and, and seeing whether or not this suggestion could put the first client, the one who's reporting the abuse at risk, whether or not I want to say, you know, I would suggest that your cases are, you know, intertwined in a manner that it might, it might benefit you to have separate attorneys. So that's, that's something that you'd want to read the room on. It looks like Sharon had the question and I think you, I thought I saw you answered this in the chat, Grace, if, if a client says they never told you about it. Yeah. There was, looks like you provided an answer in the chat. 
yeah, and I accidentally tagged the wrong person. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it depends on what kind of relief you're looking for. I mean, if the person's potentially eligible for a VAWA self-petition, if the you know spouse has uh, U.S. citizenship or permanent residence, to be able to apply for that, the service has to accept incredible evidence. And, you know, when I was doing direct representation, I did win several cases where it's just the client's declaration and maybe a neighbor or a friend who could articulate, you know, the some of the other elements like, you know, residence together or, or something like that. But a U visa, if the only possible remedy would be a U visa because of lack of marriage or um, the abuser has no status, that kind of thing, then that's something to talk with them about, about future, yeah, if they need to contact law enforcement, they're going to need a law enforcement certification. So there's that. Okay. Thank you, Grace. Um, and one last question for Becky Jennings. It's proving very difficult to where I live to find pro bono legal representation for DV survivors who, need, who seek divorce or need to fight custody battles. Any suggestions? Yeah, I think... You know, that's the ongoing challenge. You know, there are a lot of Office of Violence Against Women funded legal resources around the country. And so, I mean, I think they're, most of them are going to be tapped into either your domestic violence program. Some of them work directly with domestic violence programs. And so I would look at that resource list. If there's any in your community. There are other, you know, your local bar association, whether they've got pro bono programs there may be that. And then, you know, uh, legal aid generally, your federal or state funded or LSC funded legal services organizations can help with domestic violence. Depends, you know, it's really, it's so local and individual service provider directed in terms of uh, whether they provide direct label representation in those situations. So, you know, and then there's, you know, there are pro bono attorneys out there that have a private practice that may, but they're often tapped into those same networks through the domestic violence advocacy organization. So I would start with maybe non-legal programs to see who they work with and figure out if there's any connections there. Sometimes also uh, law clinics at, at uh, law school, local law schools might also be all right, great. Well, we are uh, about out of time, and I see a couple of suggestions in the chat too as well. So please check those out. Um, thank you for offering those, Haley and, and Monica. Lastly, again, if you're interested in joining the ILSA Legal Service Provider Network, you can shoot us an email at ilsainfo at icf.com, and please put in the subject line, joining the LSP Network. Again, this slide presentation, a copy of the recording, and all the resources here will be sent down to you after today's session. I thank you all for coming. And please, Hannah, if you would please put the link in the chat to our survey. We have one minute left. That's about how long it takes to fill out that survey. So please take a moment and do that. And as well, thank you again, Grace, Grace and Dina. Um, a wonderful presentation. I appreciate your sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone.